thank you for being here this evening to hear what I'm hopefully um, over the course of the evening persuade you why I think at the very least that, that we need to ask this question and why it matters. As I was putting the slides together, it forced me to think a little bit about the history of my being involved in this particular topic. Um, and it was a bit startling to realize that I've actually been working on this for 16 years now. Um, and I uh, reflected on those 16 years and thought that in many ways I've been on a bit of a journey. And I thought a little bit harder and realized that actually my journey isn't over yet. I really did, didn't think when I started working on this that it would be such a long journey. Um, so what I would like to do is to tell you about how that journey started, what happened, uh, what has been going on along the way. And I think by the end, um, I will um, potentially be able to tell you why I feel like I've reached a bit of a crossroads at this point, and um, that I have in recent years, because, well, it's not in recent years, in recent months, because of a sabbatical I was on last year, decided which of those roads I, I want to take, and I'm very happy to tell you, tell you a little bit more about that. But let me begin with some, something that actually coincidentally happened the year that I uh, really began uh, doing the research on this question about whether fish feel pain. And it wasn't anything to do with science. This is actually some art that went on. Um, this is Marco Evaristi. He's a Chilean-born um, uh, artist. And in the year 2000, he put on a very provocative exhibit at the Trapholt Art Museum, uh, or Modern Art Museum, in Denmark. Um, he claimed that with this exhibition, what he wanted was his audience to wrestle with their conscience. And the exhibition consisted of a series of food blenders filled with water and live goldfish. And the food blenders were hooked up to electrical supplies. The result was that several fish during the course of the exhibit were blended. That led to the arrest for welfare and cruelty of the uh, Trapholt Museum art director and he um, uh, uh, was charged with animal uh, uh, welfare, um, uh, also animal cruelty, but later acquitted. So what's very interesting, I think, about this example is that there are many people who believe, and actually judging by some of the reactions and cringes that were going on in the room around me, um, that there's something wrong with blending a fish, a live fish. It's, it's a rather abhorrent idea. Why would you even want to engage in doing something like that? Or indeed put on an exhibition where you are asking people whether they want to do that or not. But clearly there were people who visited this exhibition who were prepared to do that or who wanted to do that or who chose to do that. So this sets up from the beginning a rather interesting polarized view we have here of fish. Some people who find this idea abhorrent and other people who are really confused by why we're even questioning this. And in fact, that's the backdrop against which I've been working over the last 16 years. It is a very polarized field. There are, field. There are some who are completely convinced that um, fish do not feel pain. They don't have a nervous system that allows them to. And equally, there are other people who ask me why I'm even doing the science and the research because it's obvious that they do. So, um, so, so that's kind of where we are. And I think that we do need to be having this debate because as we've already heard, we interact with fish in lots of different ways. And in fact, we're increasingly interacting with fish. So for example, we farm them, we use them in research, we fish for them, whether that's for sport and hobby or for actually commercial uh, fishing out at sea. Uh, we keep them as pets. Lots of different ways in which we have aquaria, um, with whether it's goldfish or tropical fish. Lots of fish are um, involved within the uh, pet industry. And I think, therefore, given that these are vertebrate animals and we are increasingly interacting with them, we should be asking the question of whether our interactions have a negative impact on the fish and whether there are welfare concerns associated with our interactions. And when we talk welfare, there are many different ways in which we can think about that word and, and what we mean by it. But a large Part of what we mean is, are we actually doing harm? And are we causing potential pain, distress, and suffering associated with the interactions that we have? This is the sort of basic premise, is this question about pain and, that, and how that relates to their welfare. So what do we know? Well, I can show you, no, it should be OK. So I can show you a video with some anecdotal evidence. This, isn't as, as, um, this particular experiment that I'm going to show you the video clip of was not designed to look at the question of pain in fish. It was uh, um, an experiment that some colleagues did in France, and they were um, ecologists very interested in, in what the fish were eating. 
But it turned out that what they were doing when they showed me this particular video clip, it was like, could, it, could I have a copy of that? That's actually very useful. So I'm going to show you now data that, well, sorry, a recording that they made. And there are three clips. Um, the, the, they're all reasonably short. And what's happening in these clips are that trout, who have all been um, food deprived for the same amount of time and so should be similarly motivated to eat, are presented, first of all, with a smooth back uh, little invertebrate, little critter here that they're going to eat. And then here, we've got some spiny forms. So the second two clips are these, these, uh, um, these are, uh, little gamorids, they're called. And, and these guys um, uh, have these spines on their back that uh, seem to make them harder to consume. So let me go ahead and show you these clips. Hopefully that's going to work. Here we go. So here is Blink and you'll miss this. It has no trouble eating this smooth-backed form. So that's the smooth one. Fairly easy. Now in the next clip, you're going to see similar-sized fish trying to eat one of these spiny ones. <laughs> so it gets it. And what you're going to see is over and over, it keeps spitting it out and trying to take it in again. It's as though it's just not able to get it into the right orientation so that it can actually swallow it. But finally, it does but it's taken quite a lot longer. And here, <coughs> this is a really nice example of one trial learning. So that fish stays in the tank with the gamma red for the same amount of time, the same duration, but it doesn't go near it again and doesn't try to eat it. Okay? Now, that's anecdotal, all right? But it certainly looked, or what we seem, seem to see here, is that something sharp within the mouth of the fish was having an aversive reaction there. Was that painful? Well, maybe to answer that, we need to start by asking, what do we mean by pain? What is pain? So how are we going to define it? It turns out this is actually quite a difficult thing to do, because even in humans, we're not exactly sure um, what pain is. We don't actually know where in the brain. You can't point to a single part of the brain and go, that's the pain center. That's where you're feeling pain. It's a lot more complex than that. But what I think we can do is start to think about what its function is. So its function is that it's an adaptive process and it's there to protect. And uh, as such, we would expect m most animals to have some kind of protective mechanism. Because if you can't protect yourself and you can't learn about what's damaging in the environment, um, you're not going to live for very long. So an adaptive process that's going to potentially help you increase your, your survival so that you can re reproduce and therefore you're going to produce more offspring. So it's got, there's a selective advantage here, an evolutionary selective advantage, that is, is likely here to be promoting, again, the evolution of pain processes. But it also turns out, and this is where it starts to get a little gray, that pain is also a, a subjective experience. So you could tell me about a pain that you experience or, or a, a pain that you currently have. I can't feel your pain. I might be able to empathize a little bit with you because I might, it, bits of the description that you give me might sound familiar and I might be able to think about other pains that I've had that might in some way overlap with that. But I'm never going to understand exactly what it is that you're experiencing. And that's the problem that we have with animals. At least with another human, I have the ability to converse and talk and to hear the description. But with an animal, I haven't got that option. So what sorts of things can we do? Well, we can look at what's going on during the pain process and try to see if there are er um, aspects of that that maybe we can start to get at with experiments. Um, and that's kind of where we started. And as I began to look at this, it became clear that, in fact, pain isn't just one thing. It's, it's, it's several processes. But broadly speaking, you can largely break it down into two separate processes. And these, the, the, the distinctions that we make between these two processes is actually very important. So the first phase, imagine that you have something pricking into your finger, something sharp, and um, your reaction is, is to move away from the thing that's actually caused the damage. And this first part is called nociception. All right? so there are, and, the, and nociception simply means detection of something damaging. That is there purely so that you have this reflex response. It's an unconscious response that something damaging has occurred. And it occurs in us and other animals that have a, a, a backbone. At the level of the spinal cord, you get a reflex reaction that sets up. The information doesn't have to go anywhere near the brain in order that you pull your finger away. Same with touching something hot. Many of you will have actually dropped something that's hot before you've even thought about the fact that it's burning you. So you actually react before um, the, there's this conscious awareness of something being painful. So this first stage, the, the reason I'm breaking this first stage out is because it is unconscious and because it can happen in a, at a fairly basic level um, um, with a nervous system uh, that doesn't require a brain. 
right? The second part is when the signal does transfer up to the brain, and at that point, we then get the, ow, that hurts. So we get this emotional response that something is hurting and it's bad, and it could be an intolerable pain, or it, in the case of the pinprick, an acute pain, which is, is sore, but it eventually stops. So it's this a second stage of pain, which is this experience, this subjective experience. And this is the bit that I think we really need to focus on and be interested in when we're talking about which animals feel their pain. Um, now, in us, these two processes are very highly interlinked. They're, they are um, uh, highly dependent on one another, very tightly coupled. But in fact, because we can separate them out and show that there are these two distinct processes, I think it suggests that there may well be different evolutionary pathways of how these two processes work. And that's important when we want to now try and ascribe pain processes to animals within the rest of the animal kingdom, just apart, apart from us. So recognizing that there are two stages allows us now to broaden out what we're looking at to, to other animal groups. So if we look at the first stage again, that unconscious detection of pain, and we look at the animal kingdom, which I've shown you in this sort of cartoon-like form here. We've got animals from sponges and jellyfish um, through to uh, us here, so vertebrates, um, mollusks here, and then all the way through a series of very curious worm-like creatures, which we broadly lump together as worms, but they're, they're different animal groups. And then away over here, we've got the insects and scorpions and spiders and so forth. Now, where we've looked, and again, there hasn't been a very systematic look at this, but where people have looked, the following groups here all show signs of this nociception. And in actual fact, I would argue, so we've got, uh, I should just point out what these are. So we've got the jellyfish here, for example, uh, sea anemones and uh, other creatures of, uh, of that nature. We've, uh, obviously, we've got the vertebrates, which we've already been talking about. But then here we have the group that are mollusks. And what's interesting about this group in particular is that they include things like octopus and squid which are a very interesting group, extremely intelligent animals, um, very alien looking and do things in a very strange way and they have a very different brain to the brains that we have. Um, but nevertheless, there are aspects of their nervous system that clearly appear to do this nociception part. And um, the, the responses that they have are very similar to the kinds of response um, that we see in vertebrates. It's fine. Um, then we also have uh, uh, certain forms of worm where this has been looked at. And then quite a lot of work that's been going on more recently in this group, um, which we call arthropods, and here, in here particular, things like lobsters and crabs, because people are also very interested in whether lobsters and crabs have this capacity. So where we've looked, we found no susception. And although we haven't looked in the rest of these animal groups here, I'm willing to bet that they will all have that basic capacity. Because if they didn't, when something damaging happened, they would be dead. So it makes logical sense that you have to have some kind of ability to respond to noxious, bad things in the environment. Now, the second part is a different story. And if we look at where this second part is actually happening, I would argue at the moment the only evidence we have is that it's within this group, within the chordate group, so groups that have a backbone. And uh, uh, within that group, we've got birds, mammals, and fish. Um, and I... I um, uh, hope to show you the evidence that, that um, uh, we have, or the, the, the experiments that we did tonight, why I'm confident that that is the group where we see it. Now, will we see this second stage process in some of these other animals? Potentially, over here in the mollusks with the cephalopods and the octopus, yes. Um, there is some very engaging and interesting work going on in these areas right now. I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we have that evidence. But I um, wouldn't be at all surprised if that particular group um, didn't show us something interesting. And then down here, lobsters and octopus, uh, sorry, not lobsters, lobsters and crabs. Again, some very interesting work going on at the moment. It hasn't shown the second capacity here, this feeling, this emotional awareness. Um, but again, what I'm currently trying to work on are experiments that will specifically be um, um, comparative experiments that will allow us to address that question, will allow us to look at this. Okay, so where does this, this, this end up? I mean... Um, here I'm suggesting that uh, all vertebrates are doing this, but when I started this work and I started on this journey, I had to ask the question, okay, are, do fish actually have this capacity to do just the first one of these processes, the nociception, or are they actually doing both? Okay, so what do we need then? How are we going to determine this? So um, we, uh, I sat down with a colleague, Mike Gentle, who was uh, an animal, a, a bird animal welfare specialist, 
And we sat down and, and asked each other what, what kinds of things we would need to know. And we came up with a framework of three general questions that we wanted to um, um, address. So first of all, what kind of uh, receptors do the fish have? Is it similar to the kinds of receptors that we have in our skin that detect things um, when it's, for example, crushing or ex um, excessive heat or excessive cold? Um, and uh, uh, chemical kinds of damage, so something that's acidic that uh, um, interacts with the skin and burns. So are those receptors present, and how do, they, um, uh, how do they compare to the ones that we already know are in birds and mammals? The second question was that if those receptors are there, what happens when they're activated? Can we, can we show that they're doing something in response to noxious stimulation? So if once we've detected where the receptors are, can we stimulate those in some way that we believe is going to be noxious and then record from the nerve fibers um, that that, that uh, uh, damage is being detected and, and conveyed within the nervous system? Um, and here we were specifically looking for certain kinds of nerve fiber, which we know in us are dedicated to the process of detecting damage. And I'll show you what those are in a little bit. And finally, we wanted to look at how this tissue damage then changes the physiology and the behavior of the fish, particularly more complex processes, more complex cognitive processes that involve things like awareness. Because when you start to look at the um, awareness of the animal, you're beginning to um, focus in on and look at aspects of the emotional components of the animal and uh, whether the animal is actually able to um, concentrate and focus and pay attention to aspects in the environment um, which are going to be potentially uh, impaired when the animal is going through a process which is painful. So what you can see in the picture here is a, is a trout that's in a cradle. It's difficult to actually make the fish. This is its head here and its tail down here. We've got the fish in a cradle and it's covered in uh, wet tissue and, um, and, and gauze to keep the fish moist uh, because we have the fish out of water at this point. It's also deeply anaesthetized. Um, so for our experiments, we anaesthetize the fish so that we can work on them. We can uh, take recordings from, um, from the nerves um, and the fish are um, in terminal anesthesia in that they're never going to recover after the work that we've done, but we need the fish alive at the point where we're doing these experiments. Now, um, these are um, uh, quite invasive experiments and we work very hard at trying to determine the, the minimum number of fish that we actually need to use in these experiments um, because we don't want to be putting many fish um, uh, through these kinds of, of process. Um, at the front end here, you can see a number of uh, pieces of equipment that are holding electrodes in place. And they're at the head here because we're focusing on the head region of the fish to determine what's going on around the face. And when we do that, what we find are that there are receptors, these nociceptors, all around the face, and in fact it turns out they're over much of the body too, but the original work that we did focused on the head and face for a couple of reasons, one of which is slightly more interesting than the other. The main reason is that, like, just like us, you've got lots of important sensory apparatus around your head. If you're going to protect yourself from damage, it makes, again, a lot of evolutionary sense that you've got a lot of detection equipment there that's going to help you protect that. So there are logical reasons why we would expect these nociceptors to be, um, to be present there. The other reason was is that the funding agency who funded this work said to us, we said we were originally interested in, in looking at the head and the fins, because when you look at where fish are aggressive with one another, it's often that they nip the fins, uh, particularly in farmed fish. Um, and uh, the agency said, don't worry about the fins. We want to know kind of what happens when, when uh, you, you know, something happens around the head region, like a hook going in through the mouth which we were right, rather surprised at because that was not our agenda at all. We were very interested in thinking about these questions related to fish farming and not to angling um, or um, uh, fly fishing. Um, but clearly there were some members on the uh, panel who reviewed our research who had different um, ideas or different questions. Um, so, so these receptors are present and there are a number of different kinds of them and they're there to detect different kinds of information. So some of them are, we call them polymodal, they're actually detecting all three kinds of, the, of information. So the crushing, the high temperatures, the, the effects of noxious chemicals. Um, and then some of them are a bit more specific than that. So you have uh, ones uh, mechanothermal, which are detecting both um, uh, crushing and, and temperature and then mechanochemical, which are crushing and um, uh, chemical detection. Are these uh, receptors actually detecting things when you put, a, 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 for example, um, uh, a tiny drop of um, a weak acetic acid solution, so a weak vinegar solution, onto one of these uh, mechanochemical receptors? 
Well, the answer is yes. So we can take it. This is a recording from um, the, the trigeminal nerve of the fish. Any of you have had dental work and have had to have a, um, an injection to numb the, your jaw before the dentist starts the work, they've gone in and they have um, put the anesthetic into your trigeminal nerve. We have three branches, one on the lower jaw, one on the upper jaw, and one that comes up around the eye. Um, so in, in this instance here, this was um, uh, from the, um, the, uh, the upper jaw where we were working, and a um, tiny drop of acetic acid goes onto the um, receptor, and you see a very fast, rapid burst of firing. So the hardware is there. These receptors are present, and when they are actually treated with something that's noxious, they respond in a way um, that is telling us that, this, the, that, that, that the um, uh, fish has detected something damaging is going on. And we know that it's damaging because if we put a tiny drop of water onto the same spot, we don't get a response. There's no recording, no rec recording there. So these, kind, these receptors are definitely detecting the different kinds of, of, of stimuli that I've talked about, whether it's crushing... Um, high temperatures or um, weak acetic acid. The interesting thing about fish that we la later discovered is that they don't actually have cold reception uh, or a detection of cold receptors in the same way that terrestrial animals do, terrestrial vertebrates. So we detect when things are freezing, it also causes a burn. Fish don't, or certainly the fish that we've, we've looked at so far, um, don't appear to uh, respond in the same way. Um, and we can talk about that in the question time if you like. Another area that's particularly sensitive, of course, is the eye. And so, again, it should be no surprise that we've also got nociceptors present on the cornea of the, um, of the fish's eye. So, um, so, so far, for questions one and two, we've got ticks. We're, we're seeing things, and um, we're certainly able to record the activity. We can also go into the nerves and have a look specifically at these fibers that are conveying the information about the damage. So if you imagine a, a nerve fiber here, if you were to split that open, it would look a lot like a rather complicated electrical wire. Inside the, the wire, the nerve, you've got lots of other wires going um, within, uh, along its length. And these are the nerve fibers that are bundled within the nerve itself. Now, of those nerve fibers that are in there, some of them are specifically conveying this, this um, uh, uh, information about the, the tissue damage. And we know that... Um, in birds and mammals, these are called A-delta and C-fibers. Um, we know roughly the size of these fibers and um, what they look like. And so when we look inside a, a fish, so we take, a, again, from this lower jaw, we take part of the nerve, we cut a thin slice of it and then have a look at this underneath the microscope. This is what you see when you stain the slide. All of these, these <coughs> circles here are all the different nerve fibers that are packed into this, this nerve. And if we blow up one section here, you can see these smallish kind of circular um, fiber types here are these A-delta fibers, which are conveying um, noxious information. <coughs> and then here, harder to see, because they don't stain as well, because they haven't got the same fatty tissue around them, but they're nevertheless here, are these things called C-fibers, which are the second kind of fiber type that does the conveying of the um, noxious stimuli. So from, this is a slide taken from the fish nerve. We've got the classic fiber types that we know are doing this role, this important role of conveying the uh, damaging information uh, in birds and mammals. They're there in fish. There is, however, an interesting difference with the fish, and that is that very um, uh, many fewer sea fibers are found in the fish compared to birds and mammals. If we were to take a, a slice like this through a bird trigeminal nerve, or a mammal's trigeminal nerve, you would see many more of these smaller C-type fibers. And again, we're not quite sure what that means, but I'm happy to discuss that in the questions, um, 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 should you wish to. Now, we have focused on the head and the face, for, as I said, for various reasons. Um, in fact, work has now looked at other regions, particularly things like fins, and they are also innovated with these um, A, delta, and C fibers. So it, it looks, from, from the work um, uh, that's been done so far, these specialized nerve uh, uh, um, fiber types and the receptors are pretty much throughout the, the, the body of the fish. So uh, in, in answer to question one and two, do the trout have these skin receptors and are they active when we stimulate them? The answer is yes. So what then about the third part, about the behavior? Well, if you, uh, to, to look at this, we did um, an, um, a number of experiments and here we needed to come up with a way of actually creating an, um, a noxious, painful um, uh, stimulus with the fish, and then something that we could compare it to, um, which we thought would not be creating a, a painful situation. So to do this, we injected small amounts into the snout of the fish of either bee venom 
and again we used acetic acid, so a, a, a weak vinegar solution. And we compared the responses of those two treatments to if we just handled the fish and, and, and put it, to, because in order to do the experiments, we need to have the fish anesthetized originally and the anesthetic can change the behavior of the fish. So we needed to control for that. But then we also gave a group, whilst anesthetized, a small injection of saline. Then saline is inert. We, we're not expecting this to have, um, a, 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 the, for the fish to have a painful response to this. And then we looked at how the fish responded after we treated them in these ways. And one of the first things we did was to look at how uh, potentially uh, it, th these um, different kinds of treatment influenced feeding uh, or interest in food. Um, when we're in pain, one of the first things that happens is that we, our, our appetite becomes suppressed. Um, and it turns out that's exactly what goes on in fish too. So here we have the four different treatments. There's the control who were just handled, the saline injection, the bee venom, and the acetic acid. And this is how long it takes the fish to start resuming feeding after they've been treated in their different ways. And you can see that the B venom and acetic acid groups here are taking considerably longer before they're showing an interest in food again after they've been treated. We also saw that uh, a number of uh, fish in this, uh, in fact, sorry, all fish in the acetic acid group showed very vigorous rubbing behavior on any hard substrate that they could rub their snout on. So on the glass walls of the tank, on the gravel at the bottom of the tank, it was a very um, uh, clear response, which we didn't see in the bee venom group. But we think the reason for that is, and one of the reasons we chose these two different uh, treatment types, is that they have a very different kind of response. I don't know how many of you have been stung by a bee. And how many of you have been stung by a wasp? Which was more painful? A wasp. Oh, I, I think, okay. <laughs> so I think this is, I have to be careful when I ask this question. In, in Europe, when you, go, when you ask this question, everybody goes, bee, it's much worse. I think there are different species of wasp around, and I think they do different <laughs> things in different places. I, I'm not an entomologist, clearly. Um, uh, the reason we use the, the bee venom here is, is that it has an inflammatory response. And the reason that bee stings are usually more painful is, is that once the venom is in there, it causes this local swelling. And it's the, it's the stretching and the swelling of the skin around where the venom is that causes the pain in us. And uh, we assumed that the simil a similar kind of process was going to happen in the fish. Um, and they would respond accordingly if, if they were detecting that as painful. Um, how many of you then subsequently had vinegar or lemon juice in a cup when you've been preparing a salad or even, right, okay. Well, it kind of nips and it stings, okay? And that's the acidic ions in there that are causing that local reaction. It's not a swelling reaction, it's just the, the, the acidic ions are causing the stinging sensation that you have. So we've got these two differences going on in the, in, in the groups here. The bee venom have got this sort of potentially stretching and, sw and, and swelling of the skin, whereas we've got this itching and irritation in this group here. And, and the itching and irritation induced this rubbing behavior that we saw in those fish. In terms of their respiratory rate, again, so how quickly they're breathing, when we have something painful happen to us, often, if you uh, think about it, your, your breathing rate changes. Um, often it's, it's, more, it's shallower and more rapid. And again, we found some interesting differences in what was going on with our four, four treatment groups. So this is the breathing rate of all the fish before we start doing anything with them. So they're all at the same, same rate here. And then this is the, the, the how quickly the gills are beating, and that gives us an idea of their, of their respiration rate. Um, and uh, uh, so this is at the start of the experiment here, after they've recovered from the treatment. And you can see that immediately, far more rapid, and for, for much longer, are our two tre treatments here with the bee venom and the acetic acid. So our groups that have been handled and that have the saline also increase their, their beat rate, but it's not as high, and it also drops back down to background much more quickly. So something about these processes of being uh, treated with the venom and acid um, changes this, the, um, um, the, 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 the breathing rate in the fish. We also know that the stress physiology changes too. And if we measure the cortisol, which is the stress hormone in these fish, it also increases. And then in addition to that, we also saw some very strange anomalous behavior that we hadn't been expecting in the um, uh, acid and venom groups, which was that the fish rocked from side to side as they were um, uh, re recovering from um, the, the treatment on the bottom of the tank. So there's a number of things that are coming in here, which again, a bit like the um, evidence that I showed you before, except now we've got some data behind this for the, for the fish that were eating the, the prey, that are clearly indicating that the treatments that we're giving the fish here in terms of the bee venom and the acetic acid are generating something um, uh, that, that shows us that the response is, is uh, um, having quite a dramatic effect on the fish. Now, um, that's fine, 
but that a lot of the changes that we're seeing here, you could say, are just basic physiological changes. So how much of, of this actually tells us that the fish is aware that something painful is occurring? Um, for that, we needed to change the approach that we had. And so for that, we designed a different experiment. And in this case, we wanted to look at how much attention they were able to pay to something that was potentially threatening in the environment um, when they were in a normal state or when they were potentially in a pain state. And so to do this, it was a, a fairly simple experiment. We had fish, in, uh, individual fish in tanks, and we then placed at a fixed distance a novel object. And fish are um, uh, typically very nervous of anything that's novel in the environment. Again, that's an adaptive response. You don't know whether it's a threat or not. So until you've figured out, out that it's not a threat, you show a clear avoidance of the object that's there. You, in other words, you don't move closer towards it. You tend to stay away. We predicted that if the fish is in a normal attentional state, we should see very little movement towards the object. If it turns out that a fish in a pain state is, is unable to focus and concentrate on this novel object in, in the environment and perceive it as a threat in the same way, then maybe it will move a little closer towards it. And that's exactly what we saw. So here we have a measure of what proportion of time during our, our trials, our behavior trials, the fish are now spending less than five centimeters with, to, to that object. In other words, they've moved towards the object. And you can see this big difference here between the group that are treated with just the saline versus the acetic acid. So it looks like we have something here that is truly affecting the attention of the fish. If that's really true, we ought to be able to reverse that effect by giving the fish some kind of pain relief. So you give the fish pain, it seems to impair its attention. If you now give the fish something painful but also something to relieve that pain, then if, it, if this is truly a pain response, we ought to see that response disappear. So we repeated the experiment, but this time we gave the fish, both groups of fish, a small dose of morphine as well as a way to, to, to counter the pain. And these were the results. So now we have lost that difference between the groups. The saline group have come up a little bit, and they are now a little bit closer to the object than they were before. But the key point is, is that we've dropped this result way down here, and we now no longer have any difference between these two. Anybody want to hazard a guess at why the saline group has moved up here a little bit? Because morphine? morphine hurts. Because morphine hurts, maybe. But what else does morphine do, or opiates in general? Tripping out. Tripping out. Tripping out. So, so they're actually relaxed about this novel object that is in front of them. It's not quite the threat that it was in the previous trials. Potentially. I'm being slightly anthropomorphic at this point. But, um, but the point is, is that, uh, that the key thing is, is that when you do provide the pain relief, look at, look at that drop, that dramatic drop there. So pulling all these bits together, what I think uh, we believe these experiments show is that when you give trout these different treatments... They lose their interest in feeding. Their gills start to beat very rapidly for prolonged periods of time. They show this tendency to rub the areas in response to certain kinds of noxious stimuli. Their perception becomes impaired, but importantly, when you provide pain relief, you can flip that around and you can get reinstate this normal behavior. So together, we believe that that was pretty good evidence that fish are able to detect and feel their pain. They're doing the two processes that I talked about at the beginning. So we published the work, and um, I guess this is where I was very naive. I didn't think it was going to receive the attention that it did, but it received a lot of attention. Um, and newspapers picked it up, and suddenly I found that things were being said, or words were being put into our mouths that, uh, that we had never claimed and never said, but, but um, it got a lot of debate going in a hurry. And it also generated um, uh, a kind of opposite side of the argument uh, react, response and reaction, and papers started to be published that um, had titles like this, so Anthropomorphism and Mental Welfare of Fishes. And this article um, described at length how we were completely wrong. We couldn't say what we did because fish didn't have key areas of the brain that humans have in order to process and feel pain. And because fish didn't have those areas of the brain, they couldn't possibly be feeling pain. Um, and these kinds of papers came out. There were several of them. And so after that, I decided that um, I needed to try to get our side of the story out and to, to uh, the general public who were um, interested in this question um, but not able to access the literature in the same way that these academics were. So I wrote um, the book, Do Fish Feel Pain, as a popular science book to try and get the debate going more generally. But it didn't stop there. I then found um, new papers coming up with, can they really feel pain? Um, 
uh, and then very flatteringly, my book got translated into Japanese. So the Japanese who are culturally have a very in, uh, a strong history and interest in, in, in fish. Um, but again, it didn't stop there. And even this last year or earlier this year, um, um, another paper uh, came out about uh, why fish do not feel pain. And uh, I know there are people in the room here who actually responded to this, um, but here's the title of the paper um, that my colleague and I wrote, which is why human pain can't tell us whether fish feel pain. <laughs> and it really can't because we're looking at two very different things. We're looking at very different structures, very different brains. Um, so uh, what is it about the brain or, or, or where do we need to look to actually uh, determine what's going on and how can we do that in fish? Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail of this, but what I can say is that if you um, have a look within the fish brain, you can see very similar structures to what's in, or, or at least you can uh, define key areas that are uh, similar to our own brains. There are definitely areas that are missing, and the key area that's missing is the cortex, which is the crinkly bits of our brain. When you look at the brain and you see all the crinkles, that's a, a, a layer, a thickish layer of cortex, which is doing very important work and very important um, processing. Fish have a very thin layer over the um, forebrain area here, which seems to do some of that, but it's clearly different and clearly not capable of doing the same complex um, uh, processing that we do. But then we're not arguing that fish are humans. Fish are fish. Um, we're looking at what they can and how they respond to um, uh, different kinds of stimuli. What we do know is, is that if you, if you put a needle prod behind the gill cover or you give the fish a mild electric shock on the, on the tail and then you look at where that signal is being processed, it is going up to the brain. Um, it moves up the brain stem into the hind brain um, and you can take recordings of it in um, uh, the, the, the telencephalon, the forebrain here. And I've got an arrow in particular at this point here because we do know that that part of the brain is very much associated with fear processing. So if you ablate that part of the brain from the fish, their ability to show normal fear avoidance of novel objects or, or whatever it may be, a predator, um, that, um, that's abolished when they no longer have that part of the brain. Um, so there are some cer certainly some similarities in different structures within the brain, and, and we can do things like lesion experiments to look at what happens when they, they, they don't have those. But in the same way that it's very hard in a human brain to point to exactly where the center is for pain, um, we have a hard time trying to do this in fish as well. To show you some more similarities, um, there's a lot of work right now going on with these guys. We're going to come back to these um, in a little bit. These are zebrafish. They are now a very uh, classic model, um, uh, model organism that we use in biomedical research. They're used in huge numbers. Um, these are brains from uh, taken fr a slice taken through the, um, if you take a, a, a slice between the nose and the eyes of the fish, this is what it would look like. And you can, uh, in this particular example here, these are the dopamine and serotonin circuits. So circuits that are very much associated with reward and pleasure, um, which you can see well, well mapped out here and um, uh, sh showing that these circuits are also uh, ple ple pleasant, present in the fish. Um, and as I just said, we also know within the forebrain that there are these specialized areas, um, particularly related to structures within our own brains like the hippocampus and also the amygdala. And the hippocampus is integrally, very tightly linked with learning and memory processing. Um, so you learn about dangerous events, for example, you need a hippocampus. And then the amygdala, which is uh, uh, de dealing with basic emotions, um, such as, for example, fear. Right. I want to stress... Again, what I'm not saying at this point is that what the fish is experiencing is the same as what we're experiencing. I am saying that I think the fish are experiencing pain, but I think they're experiencing pain for a fish, not as in a human. And I think where we get um, the wrong side of each other when we're having these debates about what fish, and can, fish can and cannot do is we seem to forget this, that there is this difference here, this very highly convoluted cortex surrounding our brains versus the much more simplified vertebrate brain of the fish. And it's very important that we remember that difference. So given all of this, why does any of it matter? Um, this gentleman here is Jeremy Bentham. He was um, quite a character. Um, many of us now probably are influenced by his work because of um, yeah, his being the sort of um, father of uh, utilitarian philosophy or utilitarian thinking. Um, and many other aspects, actually. He was ahead of his times in, in a lot of the... Um, uh, writing that he did. One of the things he's famous for saying, though, is the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? 
And now we're moving into the question of why this pain question actually matters. So what we're asking here is whether the fish have this capacity to suffer from their pain. And, uh, um, and, and we were hearing just in the introduction why that matters. It matters because we use and we interact with fish and we kill fish for various reasons in huge numbers. So over a, a thousand billion fish, for example, are captured and killed annually. And that was an estimate that was made in 2010. I was talking earlier with a, a, a colleague who's suggesting that actually it may be way more than that. Um, so, you know, we readily consider welfare and aspects associated with that and trying to relieve pain and suffering in birds and mammals. Given the evidence I've just demonstrated and shown you here, really, I think the question is, is, well, shouldn't we actually be trying to provide the same kind of welfare considerations to fish as well? And uh, let's have a look at how we do interact with them and why I think this matters. So, for example, there are lots of implications for welfare with fish and our interactions. So aquaculture. It's a very rapid growing form of farming. It's actually the only form of farming that's continuing to increase at the moment. And it looks set to do so at least for the next 15, possibly 20 years. Sports fishing. We, um, a lot of people regularly go out and choose uh, to fish. Um, the, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to that in a minute. Harvesting fish at sea. This goes on out of sight. Is it out of sight, out of mind? Do we actually know what goes on in terms of the fishing and what the fish are experiencing when they're being caught? And here are those zebrafish again, massively used in research. They're now the go-to animal, rather than actually using lab mice for many of the standard tests that we used to use, we now use fish. So thousands of these guys are used in, in, in labs um, uh, every year. Let's have a look now at a little bit more detail on the kinds of things that we do when we're uh, farming, whether it's, uh, sorry, when we're um, harvesting fish, whether it's commercial fishing or it's actually aquaculture. Um, Things, uh, uh, the numbers are huge. In the last 30 years, uh, capture fisheries, for example, have increased from about 69 million tons to 93 million tons. And in aquaculture, we've increased production from a mere 5 million tons about 30 years ago to more like 63 million tons today. And this number, as I said, is increasing. And we know that because uh, proje uh, projections for both these kinds of fisheries are that capture fisheries are going to continue at about the same amount um, uh, up until about 2030. Aquaculture is going to grow, and uh, the growth production is, is that eventually it will uh, reach the same amount as our capture fisheries, um, if not overtake that a little bit. So m much of the world's um, fish protein will come from fish farming. So when we look at the fish farm and we think about what's actually going on, what are the welfare concerns? Well, I think there are a number of them. I've highlighted just six here, and because I haven't got very long in the talk, I'm just going to talk about two of these, so slaughter methods and disease and parasites. But I also think the stress, both acute and chronic stress, that's associated with how we um, house the fish, for example, how we handle the fish at different stages when we need to grade them and what have you. Uh, so size grade them um, to decide which kinds of, of pen they should go in. The inability of the fish to express normal behavior is uh, considerable. They're in very confined space. Often these fish, particularly with salmon, for example, are used to migrating very long distances. Well, they're simply not able to do that within the confinement that we keep them. We do a number of things like vaccinate the fish, and there are also a lot of deformities that are allowed to persist within the populations that we keep in captivity that are very likely going to be uh, painful. In the wild, those fish would, would um, uh, be culled out of the system, most likely by predation. So the way in which we capture and slaughter fish, um, very different between the two industries. Within aquaculture, we now have developed in a number of countries capacity to actually stun the fish before the fish are then handled and bled out. So you can see what's happening here is, is that um, fish are brought, brought out of the water. They're put into this um, apparatus here, which is, uh, in this case, an electrical stunner. And then once the fish are um, stunned unconscious, the um, handlers come in and they cut the gill arches so that the fish bleed out very quickly, whilst the fish is unconscious at that point. That's very different to what we do at sea, where we haul trawl nets up from great depths, so you've got rapid pressure changes that are occurring. Um, and then uh, um, if the fish is um, still conscious at the point when it's up and out of the water, it then goes through this process of crushing, because suddenly the weight of the fish as you, as you pull the trawl net out um, and then the fish are left on deck to suffocate. Um, that's not a very good end. Um, is it good welfare? I think you could argue, no, it's not. 
But you could also argue that it's very brief. It's a very short part of the life of the fish at the end. And up until that point, the fish has had a life to swim around the sea and live quite freely. So um, a short amount of suffering at the end is maybe not so bad compared to the situation where these uh, fish within aquaculture are very confined and not able to do that normal behavior. So we have to make some decisions there about what's appropriate. So um, slaughter methods in, in fish farming have definitely improved. Uh, for a long time, in the early days, we were doing a lot of carbon dioxide narcosis. We now know that that's actually a very unpleasant way for the fish to die. It's actually a very unpleasant way for any animal to die. Interestingly, it's currently the most widely used euthanasia method for uh, laboratory rodents. Um, but it's not a very... If you, when you do the experiments and you have a look at how aversive the, the rodents find this carbon dioxide as a... Um, a way to be put to sleep. It's, um, it's not good. And there are alternatives. And I would say in the next five years, we will be seeing those alternatives used um, much more frequently. So uh, this is what an electrical stunning machine looks like. Basically, the fish swim up a channel in water and then hit down onto this metal grill. The grill is electrified, and so as the fish hits the grill, it, um, it is stunned. In this case here, we have fish swimming up chutes that come down to these um, uh, individual areas here. And these have a hammer which comes down very rapidly onto the top of the head and destroys the brain, so that, again, the fish is unconscious. Uh, th so that's how we're doing it within aquaculture. And uh, we've, uh, these, these, so we've got better at doing it, and we've got uh, more refined methods. What about um, capture fisheries? Well, the argument I'm usually given at this point is, well, we've been doing this for thousands of years. Why should we change? Um, well, I think we should change for the reasons that I've just said. This is not a particularly good death for these fish. And, you know, given that we actually know how we can do this in a more humane way on an aquaculture, in an aquaculture setting, couldn't we be trying to transfer some of that te technology to the way we actually capture fish at sea? And um, a number of um, uh, researchers are taking that on board. Um, oh, that's a bad pun, sorry. Um, I really didn't mean to do that, anyway. Um, uh, and, and, so, and, and they're looking at how to take these methods onto, research, uh, onto uh, shipping vessels, commercial vessels. So in both Norway and in Holland, they are putting percuss, uh, sorry, electrical stunners onto ships. And um, they are also looking at methods where you bring the fish net up much more slowly. Uh, this is for trawling. Much, uh, much um, less um, issue with the pressure changes that are occurring as you bring the fish up. And then keeping the fish submerged, so never actually bringing the net out of the water, you pump the fish into containers in the base, in the base of the ship, which have large, um, vats, uh, large vats of water, where the fish then can be, on a much smaller numbered scale, be dealt with, um, um, so that they're stunned and then bled out, just as we were looking at in the aquaculture industry. Now, that requires a lot more... Um, uh, investment in terms of human time, so you need bigger crews to actually be working the ships, um, and each fish is going to uh, take more time to be handled and killed, so it's going to push the price of the fish up. But in addition to actually applying these um, methods onto ships, uh, on, onto research ships to see whether this is commercially possible, they've also done a lot of survey work at looking at willingness to pay from the consumer, knowing that the fish has actually been caught and harvested in this way. And there seems to be uh, a model out there that suggests that consumers would be more willing to pay for more expensive fish if they have been harvested um, in this uh, more welfare-friendly way. Okay, so, so potentially some good news there is something that we can use that we've developed in aquaculture and apply it in a positive way to the wild fishing. Another aspect that, that is very much associated with aquaculture and keeping fish in very high numbers is that all sorts of very nasty fish diseases um, are now um, quite common. And uh, we have all sorts of problems there with it's not just the farmed fish that are being affected. We actually end up getting spillover to um, um, uh, wild fish um, that are contracting some of these diseases when they are too close to the fish farms. So there are a number of things we can do. And in fact, routinely now for fish farms, we vaccinate fish. So um, every fish that has been farmed that you, you will eat will have had, um, salmon at any rate, will have had um, a, a vaccine, of, at least one vaccine, if not more. And the vaccines are doing good things for the fish health in that here, these are the outbreaks of um, uh, disease um, that were happening um, from 1979 to the early 90s. And then here, is, in, shown in blue, is the development of the vaccination um, or the vaccine um, uh, a cocktail of vaccines that uh, fish have been given. Um, and you can see that uh, the, the disease outbreaks at this point, uh, so in the early 90s when we'd actually really developed the right kinds of vaccine for, that these fish needed, um, the, the uh, evidence of the disease uh, rapidly dropped. 
Um, but the number of fish that were now being vaccinated has gone up as we have um, increased the number of fish that we're actually farming. So uh, again, we can get quite clever with the vaccines, um, but we have to be aware of uh, the impact that we're having with the fish in the wild that are not being vaccinated. Those diseases are still out there. Um, and there is some tension there about what that actually means. Using fish in research, we use fish for all sorts of um, uh, question, whether we're interested in the sort of basic biology of them or whether we're using it for biomedical research. Um, and this raises all kinds of questions about how we should handle the fish, um, how we should um, um, house them. Should we actually give them uh, in environments that are enriched in some way with objects that the fish can interact with and swim around? Um, what kinds of species differences are there? Oh, I keep talking about fish. Fish actually represent more than 37,000 different species. The requirements of those different species are going to be very different, um, and we certainly need to be cognizant of that. Um, and then with zebrafish, we're actually producing a lot of knockout mutants in the same that we have for um, mice, which we use in biomedical research. Um, the processes of actually producing those knockout mutants can be quite, uh, quite grim in many cases, let's say. Um, so uh, so not all, you go through a lot of mutants before you actually produce a mutant that's going to be useful for what you're interested in. Um, once you've got the one you're interested in, that's fine. But, you know, when you think about all the casualties that went into actually producing that one, there's a, there's a lot of waste at that point. And here's just to um, uh, really demonstrate to you what labs can look like now. So this is a, a zebrafish lab. At one point in, in, in an animal room, this lab would have been full of little shoebox size um, uh, cages, which would have had mice in them. And we've replaced much of that with these uh, zebrafish facilities. Um, so good at one level, we're, we're kind of working on a, a vertebrate that some would say is a lower vertebrate. And so we're, we're um, uh, trying to address welfare by not using a mammal but we're still using a very large number of fish in these kinds of facility. And how we keep them, how we um, breed them and maintain them, and the, the kinds of housing we give them are remarkably different from where they actually evolved and, and um, uh, the kinds of environment that they would be in. Interestingly, almost all of these facilities have very little in the way of enrichment for the fish within the tank. And there's a lot of contention about whether, whether we should have anything in those tanks at all. Um, I recently had a graduate student do some experiments to have a look at what the fish would like. That may sound a bit silly to ask a fish what it would like, but she did it, and she did it this way, which I thought was quite clever. She gave the fish experience to begin with of two different kinds of uh, bucket. One had different background colours. The other one had um, objects in there, in this case, different coloured plants, or an area where they could be with nothing at all. And she looked at where they were spending their time, each individual fish that she was testing. And then she needed a way in which she could actually look at how where, where the fish would prefer to be and how, mu how much they would want to get there. So she designed this little box here which had four windows and the windows were hinged very slightly so that the fish could push and she could see every time the, the hinges were, were lifted up. And the apparatus slides into the, the um, uh, uh, buckets like this and she was able to detect from this where the fish wanted to be. What was very interesting about this was that fish definitely had preferences of where they wanted to be, but lots of them had different preferences. So different fish actually wanted different things. So some fish liked the green plant, others liked the orange plant. Um, some fish liked the uh, green background, others preferred the blue and so forth. So these, in, but, and these individual differences were extremely consistent over the time that she was actually measuring. So again, we haven't really asked question, questions of fish in this way before, but we can do uh, if we design the right experiments. So I think uh, there are a number of things that positively that we could do to impact and improve the welfare there. Sports fishing is something that um, I get probably most queries about. Again, this was an area that naively when I went into this, I really didn't think that this was going to be an area that was going to generate interest in what we were doing. But I was very wrong about that. Um, I have never said that we shouldn't uh, capture uh, fish for sport. Um, I have a lot of um, colleagues who do this for a pastime. Um, one of my sons goes fishing. Um, and I think there are some very good things that come out from the interactions that people have, just in terms of getting outdoors and being out in a natural environment is a good thing. But I think if you're out there and you are interacting with the fish, then you should know what, what your interactions are potentially doing to the fish and um, think about the apparatus that you use and so forth. And then we have interesting questions about whether you should catch and kill, and if you're going to do that, kill as quickly as possibly and know how to kill the fish effectively. Or if you're going to catch and release, um, then again, how are you going to handle that fish? What kinds of apparatus are you going to use so that you can very quickly take the hook out and put the fish back in the water? Or don't even take it out of the water if you don't have to. And in North America, this is a huge debate that is going on because 
um, uh, the philosophy and ideas be behind anglers who do go fishing in uh, North America. And I have to say, I'm sorry that I don't know what the, the emphasis here is in Australia. I suspect that it's catch and kill. Um, but within North America, it's catch and release because people feel or the need to conserve the fish that are out there. So they're happy to go and to catch the fish, but they then put the fish back into the wild for um, conservation reasons so that the fish can breed and so forth. The problem with that is that on sites and areas where you have a lot of fishing going on is that these fish are repeatedly caught and they're going through that whole process um, multiple times. And again, we can come back into questions uh, during the question time about why they might be doing that and um, what that might say about whether it's painful or not. That's usually one of the questions I, I get. Um, but we're also getting very good at educating, particularly uh, the young fishers that we, we bring on. So education programs that actually teach young kids how they should handle fish are now very popular. We don't need to take fish out of the water. We have cameras that can take pictures of fish underwater. So why don't we use those more? Um, and again, I think uh, many people who are... Uh, so some of the fish, best fish biologists I know are passionate fishers as well. And, um, you know, they... they um, know from having interacted with the fish for, uh, for, for many years that, that, that they've caught what is good or not good welfare for the fish that they're catching. So actually, um, when I'm interested in, in talking about aspects of fish welfare, particularly in terms of um, uh, for, for sports fishing, these are the kinds of people I will go and talk to because um, they, they can inform me the best. And using the right apparatus, knotless nets and things like that, things that are not going to cause abrasions um, to, the, to the scales and, and knock the scales or the mucus um, off the fish, these, these things are commercially available. And so people have already thought about this. I'm not saying anything new here. Um, there are, so commercially available materials um, which are going to help improve the um, uh, welfare of the fish are, are available. Pets and keeping pet fish, I started out by uh, suggesting um, uh, that, again, there's a huge industry here. Um, we need to think about the source of the fish. Um, we're we're um, uh, somewhat better than we were about 20 years ago, at, at, uh, uh, particularly for reef fish, um, wh where those fish actually come from and how they're harvested. Um, and in fact, interestingly, films like Finding Nemo have been quite, import you know, quite important to informing people about what could or couldn't happen before. Um, there are still questions about uh, the kinds of enrichment we should put in a tank. Should goldfish be kept in a tank like this? Um, uh, and then public aquaria. They're growing in terms of, you know, the more aquaria are built and we stock them with fish. But then once the fish are in there, things remain very static. Things don't change. And I have a graduate student at the moment who's working uh, in a particular aquarium in, in um, Long Island Sound where she's been showing that, in fact, the visitors turn out to be an enrichment for the fish. <laughs> so when the, when the visitors move through the aquarium, the fish move to the windows and start interacting with the visitors. And when they've gone, they retreat back into the dark, dark areas. Um, and the fish are also very good at timing when opening hours are. So they start to come out. Uh, before the visitors have, have even come into the room, the fish are kind of moving out and, and looking, I guess, whether they can interact. But when you film from within the tank, you actually see that the only thing that's changing in the environment is the movement of people outside. And that seems to be attracting the fish. OK. So I think trying to pull these different... Sorry, that worm shouldn't have appeared there. It was supposed to come in a minute. Let me just pull everything else up and then it's not out of place. OK. What, I'm, um, um, what I think is important here then to answer the question about why it matters is that we need to consider how our interactions are impairing the, the, the welfare of the fish. That's why we need to ask that question. But I also think that in answering, asking that question of why it matters, there's a really interesting side part, and in a way this is the sort of route that I've now decided to take. I said I've reached a, a crossroads and where I'm going. I, the, the decision I've had to make is whether I continue trying to do experiments that <coughs> demonstrate fish feel pain. But actually I think I've already done that, so I don't think I need to do that anymore. What I do want to do is I want to move on to the next, the, 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 in a different route, a different direction, and carry my journey on um, wherever that's going to take me to actually think very carefully about what it is that, that pain is doing and how we can demonstrate um, uh, the, the, when something is more than just the nociception. So how can we demonstrate an, an emotional awareness in uh, an animal that is showing us that um, uh, something is impairing its behavior because of the hurt that it's experiencing? And one of the reasons why I think that's important is that if we're going to address these questions in octopus, lobsters, or even worms, those are the kinds of experiments that we're going to need to do. They are not easy, uh, they're not trivial, um, but I don't think it's beyond us to actually design the right experiments to uh, come up with a research framework that's going to allow us to address that. So with that, I would just like to finish by 
acknowledging that I would not be able to stand here and talk to you about um, the different ideas, topics, the experiments that we've done if it weren't for a great number of um, collaborators and students and um, wonderful colleagues who um, are very gracious with their time and uh, um, are very happy to have discussions with me about these kinds of topics that I've been talking to you about this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.